Stephen Roy Goodman, host of Higher Education Today. Welcome back to the education program that connects you to contemporary issues, people, and institutions involved in the world of higher education. Today's show is a special joint production of the University of the District of Columbia and the University of Cape Town. I'm here in Cape Town, South Africa, where we'll be talking about mechanical engineering and the field of blast, impact, and survivability. Genevieve Langdon is a mechanical engineering professor in the Blast, Impact, and Survivability Research Unit at the University of Cape Town. Sherlyn Gabriel is a mechanical engineering master's student at UCT who is hoping to identify the failure modes of different composites. Ismail Gore is a UCT master's student in mechanical engineering who is interested in impact testing and the modeling of curved composite sandwich panels. Welcome to all of you. Maybe Ismail, if, you can, if we can start with you. Can you give us an overview of mechanical engineering? You came from a long way uh, you live about a thousand miles from here and you came to UCT to study mechanical engineering. What is mechanical engineering and, and what are you studying here? Um, mechanical engineering is a study of basically anything mechanical. So if we look at, for example, aeroplanes, cars, trains, all those mechanical devices are designed by mechanical engineers. So what a mechanical engineer does is he designs the system or in our, let's take an aeroplane for example, he would design the aeroplane, make sure that all the systems work well, and then we, once we've done the design, manufacturers will manufacture. And that's basically what cat engineers do. Well, we can go home now, because all we do is design planes and we go home? <laughs> no, no, not necessarily. Um, there's a lot of um, deep fundamentals that go into the aeroplane design. So, um, can, how do we keep the aeroplane in the sky, for example? understanding how the air interacts with the aeroplane and in addition, I mean, not only aeroplanes, cars, how do we get the car to move, how do we design the engine, or how do we even understand how the fuel and the air mix and cause an explosion and then allow the car to propel itself. So those things also. In addition, what has opened up recently is that even replacement body parts, so shoulder replacements, Mechanical engineers would design the actual shoulder replacement. So when someone goes by, oh, it's not only the doctor that's the one that's helping the patient get a new, get a new replacement limb. Back in the lab, there was a mechanical engineer doing the design, making sure that all the materials work well together, whether they react with the body or not. All of that foundational work is done by mechanical engineers. Fair enough. And Sherlyn, what are you studying and how does it impact what Ismail was just talking about a second ago? Well, um, I think what Ismail was trying to get at as well is that how mechanical engineers are board-based. So our, um, at least our studies, has taught us to, as we like to call it, solve problems. Um, so that's why it's applicable to all fields. And so while studying mechanics, so I did four years um, undergraduate, and now I'm currently doing a master's. And um, in your undergrad, you taught a whole bunch of different subjects, and those subjects can help you in almost any industry. I mean, it includes the finance industry. I do have a couple of friends that are working for certain banks that uh, provide solutions to um, IT as well, and not including all the mechanical things as well that people know, that people assume that that's all we do when it comes to airplane or cars, but it's not just that. So, um, yeah, that's what I'm doing, and I'll just continue with settings in more a specific field, and that's in BLAST. And speaking of BLAST, uh, Genevieve, if we can ask you a, a thing or two about BLAST, you're actually wearing a shirt that represents the BLAST department at UCT, if I understand that correctly. Yep, that's right. <laughs> so can you say a word or two about the department and about, and you're English originally, so somehow you came down to South Africa to study bomb BLAST. Yeah, so on my shirt that you see it says BISRI, that stands for Blast Impact and Survivability Research Unit. So at the University of Cape Town, we're part of the Department of Mechanical Engineering. And what we do is we look at trying to make people's lives safer. So that can be designing or material selection or how you make a part to try and make it safe from a bomb or from an impact, a car crash, anything like that where people could be in danger or buildings or um, transport systems, anything like that. So we do experiments and we also do theoretical studies. We try to model it on the computer to see if we can predict what would happen if certain things were to go wrong, terrorists were to hijack a plane and, or plant a bomb near a, near a building, or those sorts of things. Or if an accident were to happen, so if there was a gas explosion or a fireworks factory caught fire or something like that were to happen, 
and loads which maybe are not predicted by everyday life, but will be these sort of tragic events, we try and make those safer by lessening the damage or containing the explosion in a particular location where it can't hurt anybody. And you're right, I've come a very long way. <laughs> so I've come even further than Ismail. Um, I've come all the way from England. So yeah, I was, I was brought up in Liverpool in, in the north of England and I came to South Africa first as a visiting PhD student from the University of Liverpool and then eventually sort of fell in love with the place and the work and came to move here permanently in 2004. Well, I find this really interesting. One, you all have interesting stories, but two, um, I don't think about blast impact every day. Uh, as just a person who's not a mechanical engineer, I tend not to think about that that much. And, and Ismail, when you were talking about airplanes, I take a lot of airplanes, but I don't really think much about it. I get on the airplane, I get my ticket, I get off the plane, but obviously a lot goes into that. Maybe if we can dissect a little bit about the courses that you would take specifically, what courses would you offer students like Ismay on Sherlin uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that they're studying what they really need to study to be able to be great mechanical engineers who perhaps maybe would work for one of the big airlines? So if you wanted to take mechanical engineering at university, you first of all need a good grounding in science and maths from high school. So that would be the first thing that if somebody said to me they wanted to be a mechanical engineer, I'd say, is your science good, is your maths good? And those are the things that you really need to be able to do. So if you come in with good science and maths, everything else from there on is an application of some form of science or maths. So we would offer courses that would teach you why structures don't fall down when you sit on a chair, why it stays in one piece. What happens when something moves so that you can design and build machines that do what you want them to do, like a car wheel goes round in the right direction. When you turn the steering wheel left, the machine goes left. What other kinds of forces might be going on? Also, things like um, how heat travels. So if you have an air conditioning unit, how you get the person to be cool when they need to be cool and hot when they need to be hot. And fluid mechanics, which is all about how liquids and gases move in the air, which would be talking about, say, how the plane stays in the sky when the jet engines are working and what, what could cause it to dip or to fall out of the sky. And studies of those sorts of nature would be the kinds of things that we would do. And then alongside that, we would give them design courses we would teach them how to critically think about problems. And those are all sort of transferable skills. So that's why Sherman mentioned that finance industry, consulting industry are very keen on our graduates because we're not just people that can think about how a machine works, but we look at a bigger problem. We can break that problem down to smaller pieces and look for solutions to those problems. And so that's what we do. Well, that's, that, that's great. Um, do you think that you're getting that as students here at UCT and, and, and how, what kind of solutions are you looking to work on? A little more specific, if you don't, if you don't mind. Um, I mean, I'm definitely getting it here. The nice thing was is that when we did our design two course, one of the tasks was to design a Swiss Army knife. And just the design aspects of going into a Swiss Army knife, we've got all these different tools, how do we make them, how do we, we do CAD drawings. So computer-assisted drawing, do you not care? We also then tasked to think about costing, how do we, I mean, what, and also the end user, well, the, well, the person is selling to like it. Um, and that's, that's, and that's only a third year course. Fourth year course is then develop those skills further. And the nice thing is that UC also offers multiple competitions, so case study competitions, which a lot of management consulting firms like McKinsey, Bain, and Boston Consulting Group also. Um, attendees and our students, mechanical engineer students, attendees and take part in the competitions. One of my good friends also was David Keen, he did that and he's working for McKinsey right now. Fair enough. And Sherlyn, what would you add to that? Um, well, definitely. Uh, it depends on what you're interested in. I think that matters a lot for students. So, um, in terms of solutions, if you were interested later on in your year and you realize perhaps you didn't want to work in some sort of a car automotive um, industry and then you were like I'm actually interested in business and I think I can do it and I know quite a few people who have decided okay I'm going to be in business um, my personal view is uh, I'm doing masters to sort of because I wanted to go more into detail about certain aspects so um, that's what I'm currently doing and perhaps even going into more of the modeling side and seeing as in um, doing numerical simulations and seeing how the how computers can tell us more about the information about um, these materials that we have going for us. Well, that's interesting because Genevieve referenced that a second ago in terms of modeling. Maybe if we can say a word or two about the modeling. 
because I'm assuming that you don't want to have bombs just blasting everywhere, <laughs> uh, and that you want to simulate this in some way to figure out what's going to happen. Yes. So yes. can you talk a little bit about how one does that? Um, well, um, there happens to be a few commercial products there. So um, what you would do is you would have to know so stuff about your material and how to design it on a computer. So um, if you were to like draw up a building, you would be able to do that with um, certain packages and then input um, the parameters that you need to know. So where is your um, explosive detonating from or um, how far away is um, this thing, the explosion happening and what's going to happen. In, and then the computer should give you results about, um, depending on where you put your um, stresses and strains. But wouldn't we want to know that before um, we build the building? Yes. Um, so a lot of these, um, the computer modeling is used to design your experiments. So to see like what's the least amount of explosive, well, that's one of the things I'm looking, least amount of explosives is needed to completely rupture a place. And that would be needed to know, because if I completely ruptured it, I wouldn't perhaps get as much information as I needed if I perhaps were to see um, the defamation and I wanted to see something just before that happened. Um, so it, it can be used as a design tool um, and a whole bunch of other reasons too, but mostly for the expense. It is expensive to just detonate a whole bunch of plates and getting all the normal material and spending time manufacturing is responsible now. And um, yeah, so um, experiments are very costly and numerical modeling can help at least reduce those costs. Well, but when you... When you um... When you design something, whether it's a building or a train station or whatever, blast is not the only important thing. So we might think that the blast response of a plane is the most important design parameter for a plane, but the airline company might think having a lightweight plane that's going to last them 20 years and they don't need to repair might be more important to them. So there are these multiple sort of drivers for design, and then somebody, usually an engineer and a manager sitting together, have to work out which ones they're going to prioritize. And so for some applications, blast will be a low priority and for others, it'll be a high one. So it might be for some things, blast loading wasn't considered. Perhaps, perhaps 20 years ago, they weren't thinking very much about the blast protection of windows and facades in buildings because terrorists wasn't, weren't really targeting civilian buildings very much. Whereas these days, everybody's much more conscious because of the events that have happened over the past 15 years, that blast protection is far more important and the public have more in their minds that terrorism could affect them in some way, even though we all like to think about it sort of not very often. But we're all watching TV and we're all seeing these films about hijacked planes and trains and all these things that can happen and go wrong. So when that happens, then priorities change and people start looking at things that weren't designed for blast loading and saying, OK, now we need to protect that differently. How could we retrofit the building? So how could we add something to the building to make it safer? And that's why some of our public buildings and some of our political buildings now have um, bollards and things to stop truck, truck drivers from driving their trucks right up to the entrance and detonating an explosive in front of them. They set them far away. So you can't actually get very close to certain buildings. And that's on purpose. So that's not about making the building stronger so that if a bomb goes off, people survive. It's about keeping the bomb far away from the building. So there are lots of different ways of solving the problems. And some of them are very engineering related, the kinds of things we can do in the laboratory, where we would take a big scenario and scale it down to something that we can look at in the lab, like Sherlin and Ismail would be looking at. And some things are more sort of common sense solutions, low cost solutions, like putting bollards up or safety gates that people can't drive through, or screening you at the airport so that they can monitor your behavior and see whether or not you look like you might be, you know, wanting to do something dangerous or screening your shoes at the airport so you're not carrying explosives in your in your boots, for example. But that is interesting because you, you think about the multiple perspective. You raise the issue of retrofitting. So if I'm designing a building, I could design it because I'm interested in the aesthetics of it. Yeah. I could design it because I want to be welcoming to the public. I could design mm. it to be intimidating. Mm. I could design it to do any number of things. And you're saying that when that design is originally coming on, uh, on that we have to decide, you're saying that we have to factor the, the bomb blast in initially if we're going to do it correctly. 
What I'm saying is if you know that you have a high risk target building, for example, you know that it would make a great headline for terrorists. It would make sense when you're doing the design phase of the project to work out how you can protect that building from a potential threat. And whenever an engineer designs something, they design it with all the loads in, in mind. So if you design a wind turbine that's going to sit in a wind farm, one of the loads you look at is the wind. How fast could the wind be in that area? What's the highest speed the wind could be? And could my turbine fall over or could the blades fly off if that were to happen? And in, in when we look at a building or something that we think is vulnerable to an explosion, we have to say, what could be my maximum possible threat? What scenarios do I need to design against? And then it comes up to how, how can we preempt what a terrorist might do? And then we go, what's that going to cost? Is there a cheaper way to protect the people? Because we're not going to make all of our buildings out of bulletproof glass and, and hardened steels. Because even if we did do that and made every building look completely miserable and everybody felt like they lived in some sort of terrible regime where they're under tremendous threats, which would have a terrible psychological effect on people, um, the terrorists would find a way around that eventually um, because they want to get their message out in one way or another and they'll find a way to do so. So you need to come up with other methods that still allow us to have freedom, still allow us to have beauty in society, to be inspired because the cost of losing those things is, has to be weighed against the, the potential terrorist threat itself. And you could argue that they win if we lose those things from society. Interesting. So I, let's think about something like not just the airline industry, but, but a car. Right, you mentioned cars before. So let's say you're driving a car. Well, a car is very susceptible to any number of things, but a car needs to be light. It needs to be affordable. People need to be able to, to buy a car to drive their family, family members to different th places. What sorts of things are you studying with bomb blasts and cars? So actually, Sherlin's project has, has some relevance to this because one of the things you mentioned, you mentioned making a car lightweight. Another driver these days is sustainability. So ca the car industry are very interested in looking at more sustainable products. And one of those products would be a composite that's made from something plant-based. So we would call that a natural fiber composite. And Sherlin's project is all about that. Yes. Um, so um, I, I realized and read about how Mercedes, the A-Class, uh, some of them have, uh, I think it's hemp and perhaps even some flax fibers that have been reinforced with some um, polymer, so plastic. And that gives it the lightweight, but also the aesthetic feel that people care about. And um, so what I've been looking at is seeing how these materials behave against blast. Um, and not necessarily that I'm telling people perhaps we should use this type of material. It's just so that we know what will happen if so something like an explosion were to happen. And not necessarily from a terrorist attack as well, but if a mistake happened, if something just in the engine blew up, what would, how would this affect that particular composite? And you would then tell the people at Mercedes that uh, I'm going to design this piece of metal or something to protect the passengers from that blast? Well, that might be somebody in the future, but right now there isn't much information about what does happen to this, and that means that gap needs to be filled. So there first needs to be information of what happens before you can make recommendations, I believe. So. so you would go to Mercedes and say, well, here are the six or seven things that could potentially happen. Here are the probabilities of each of those things. And, here, and, and here's a sim computer simulation of exactly what's going to happen when each of those six or seven things happen. Yeah. Well, we couldn't even know about the probabilities necessarily. We we're even more fundamental than that. And the Sherlin's project is saying, if you use this type of natural fiber or that type of natural fiber, or you use glass, which is generally the standard, this is the difference you would see in response to an impact load or a dynamic load or an explosion. And we don't have that information to say how often does an explosion happen in a gas tank, for example, or how often would this happen to a particular car? That would be in somebody else's field, but we would provide the information about what would happen in those cases so that then the designer at Mercedes could use that information along with the information they get from the experts on probability or whatever, and the insurance guys that underwrite everything, to make informed decisions about their products. That's really interesting. So you, as students, or as soon-to-be graduates, you could theoretically work for Mercedes or Toyota and say, 
I would be really valuable to you in your research departments. Um, yes, I think this one had like an interview that had something to do with, because he's doing composites, and composites are quite... Um, I was recently interviewed by a drone company, um, and they make um, surveillance drones. And their particular aspect was looking at carbon fiber. So carbon fiber is a lightweight material. And because I had a lot of manufacturing experience, because my project involved a lot of manufacturing of these composite materials, um, they were very keen on listening to me and trying to understand what else I could do. Because currently they were importing a lot of their products when I actually explained that a lot of this could be made in-house and that these are the suppliers that we need to contact in order to make um, the parts they need. They were very impressed. And I think that's that's another thing that you bring to the table, especially for, those, for companies like that, is that you can start opening up um, avenues. And in particular, this company was a startup. So already now, it's bringing all those skills and contributing. Interesting. And so, so if you don't mind sharing a little bit more about some other interviews you've had, I, I think viewers might be interested in, in some of the career paths that you or, or even some of your classmates have been exploring. Mm, currently, I mean, that's the only interview I've gotten. Currently, um, I have, have been applying also to, as I said earlier, um, McKinsey and Bain and uh, Boss Consulting Group. I'm currently practicing for the case interviews for those. So what happens is the case interview is you're given a business scenario and then you are asked to comment on it. Um, and that's also another career option, totally not engineering, but because of your str strong problem-solving background and your good maths and stats background, you are very suitable for those type of problems. The only the slight downside would be is that we need to understand a bit more business concepts. So what does liquidity mean? What is the net profit? Which are not too difficult to pick up because one can always learn. And that's something engineering really taught me is that you can always learn. And especially when I went through the degree, every year it was a challenge because they always present you with a very new design concept. And you'd be, you'd be shocked, you'd be like, okay, I know nothing about this topic. And how do I, I mean, I have zero knowledge. And through the year, from zero knowledge to becoming very afraid with the subject, you, and you're astounded. Because at the end of it, you're like, okay, now I can confidently say I understand the subject. Well, you're definitely good at learning. I mean, you, you both are now TV stars. Uh, this is your first time on TV, so thank you both for doing that. Uh, and what other career options would you say, Sherlyn, for some of your uh, colleagues from your perspective? Um, I, well, I'm going to go with the stuff that I did for VAT training, and they were all quite different. So there was one which I did with Barlow World, and they did earth-moving machines, and um, so that's for the mines, those machines are giant machines, the maintenance of those. So more in the automotive, and then I did also something in terms of WBHO, which is a construction company. So looking at perhaps the the um, ventilation and air conditioning of building, that's more what mechanical engineers do in terms of in, at least in the infrastructure sector, and then also the CSIR, which is the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research. Is that, yep, that right? That's right. <laughs> yes. Um, and um, I was mostly looking at something called product design so and system design. So looking how different systems interact. But they have different divisions. They are a research unit as well, but quite a big one. And um, I got to see their um, air tunnels where they test for helicopters, which I thought was super awesome. Um, and uh, different things. And then also defense. Uh, like I've been interviewed by Denal. And Denal, um, they are part of part of the defense of the industry of South Africa and basically looking at how to model, I wanted to get into perhaps modeling different stresses on on um, airplanes, the fighter ones, so the ones that are used for missiles and all of those. So it, it was a whole bunch of different stuff, at least in my experience. This is a subject that's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> Genevieve, what would you uh, say to these questions? Because you obviously are a professor here. So when your students come to chat with you about different career paths, you I'm assuming you agree with your colleagues here, yeah. but what other things might some students be pursuing? So I ask them what they're interested in and what courses they've, they've taken that have really inspired them or stood out to them. And then I also ask them how interested they are in traveling. 
um, because certain subjects have got more, um, they're more likely to be able to pursue them if they go overseas. So if you want to work on certain things, then you need to really be working for international companies because they're the guys doing the real product development and the research and development in certain areas. Um, I've had students who want to be pilots. I've, and I've got one at the moment, he graduated last year. He desperately wants to be a pilot, but to get into that, he's gone and become a, an air steward so that he's working with the airline and then he's hoping that eventually he'll become a pilot. And that's been his dream since before he started his degree. Others go and work in sort of standard mechanical engineering jobs. I don't know that there is a standard, but um, maintenance systems, factories, manufacturing, um, design, um, all the things that Sherlyn and Ismail have talked about to do with finance and the banking sector. Um, I've had students who've started up their own companies, the entrepreneurs. I've also had students who've gone and done things which are just completely not at all connected with any of that. There was one guy set up his own um, canoeing company, all sorts of different things that students just have interest in. And somehow their engineering degrees fill them with the confidence and the ability to look at what they want to do and to solve that problem for themselves. And then all I really need to do is point them towards opportunities or in the right direction. Obviously, the other one that we, we encourage them to do is research if they show any sort of interest and aptitude for that. And so Ismail says he hasn't had many interviews. That's because we're hoping he's staying on for a PhD next year. And Ms. Sherlin is upgrading to a PhD um, very shortly. She's giving her a seminar very soon. Um, so there's also the research and, and teaching aspects of, of engineering. So you can come and become a professor. Um, and, and teach other students about what you do. And then you can also work in all sorts of fields which are on the edge of other fields. So mechanical engineering interfaces with civil engineering. So the construction industry that Sherlyn mentioned, there's an overlap there and mechanical engineers can speak both languages. And we also overlap with electrical engineering. So if you think about robotics, which are very much to do with um, computer control parts and mechanical engineers are very much at the interface of that and also the energy generating industries. Um, in this country, that would be ESCOM, but obviously anybody that generates energy in any way has to be able to transmit that energy. And mechanical engineers understand how energy is generated and how it can be moved around and how it can be transformed into other forms so that you can use your heaters in your house or, or your barbecue or whatever. And speaking of energy, I thought you all had a lot of energy today, so thank you all for coming on the show. If you would like additional information about Genevieve Langdon, Sherlyn Gabriel, or Ismail Gore, please visit www.bisru.uct.ac.za. If you have comments or suggestions about higher education today, please send an email to our viewer mailbox at highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. Thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. Please join me again for another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.